All right, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're dialing in. Thanks so much for joining us today. We are excited to talk more about Presto and ClickHouse. So before we get started, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. One is, hi, I'm Allie. Uh, I work at Ahana. I run community there, and I'm going to be moderating the webinar today. If you have questions, uh, feel free to pop those into the Q&A box, and we have a lot of time at the end of the webinar to get through those. Uh, we also have, you can raise your hand if you have a question and pop that in that way. We have emojis, so if you want to just like give a, you know, clapping or thumbs up during the presentation, that's cool too. Uh, we are recording this, so afterwards you will get a, a link to both the slides and the recording for, um, for you to use it as you like. So with that, I'm excited to introduce our two speakers. We have uh, Rohan from Ahana. Rohan is our open source product manager. He works very closely with the Presto open source community and with the Presto open source project. And we have Robert Hodges from Altinity. Altinity is the ClickHouse company, and he's the CEO there. So without further ado, I'm going to pass things over to Rohan, please. Rohan, take it away. And you're muted. Hey. There we go. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Ali. Thank, great introduction. So, hey, guys, thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's great to have all of you. Um, today, we will be talking about data lake, real-time analytics, and how what approach is suitable for you, and how you can use Presto and ClickHouse in your in your architecture, right? So, let's do a quick round of introductions. Um, let's move to the next slide. Um, yeah, so as Ali said, I'm a product manager at Ahana. I have been working on open source projects since last uh, 10 years, starting with Hortonworks. And uh, today I'm excited to talk about Presto, which is another open source project. Um, Robert, can you introduce uh, You us? bet. Yeah, thank you, Rohan. So I'm Robert Hodges. I am a data geek. I've actually been working with databases for 40 years. I say 30 plus because it doesn't make me sound so. <laughs> My day job is I'm CEO of the company, so I run the business, but I'm regularly engaged in uh, doing things with SQL and working directly with ClickHouse. Thank you. And a little bit about the companies that we work for and the today's sponsors. So a little bit about Ahana. Ahana is fully managed Presto service for AWS. So with Ahana, you can, uh, Ahana basically allows to deploy open data lake house in less than 30 minutes. So you will, um, we will give you every every piece of it. Uh, you just need to bring in your S3 bucket, that is your data. Uh, we will give you meta store authorization, um, int smooth integration with authorization, Presto cluster, and so. Um, Robert? Yeah, uh, Altenity is an enterprise provider for ClickHouse. We serve hundreds of customers. Uh, uh, we run what's uh, what we call Altenity.cloud. It's a hosted platform for ClickHouse designed for high performance uh, real-time data, uh, real-time analytics. And uh, we enable people to run these ClickHouse and the applications on top of it in the cloud, on Kubernetes and on-prem. In fact, just about anywhere. That's our business, and uh, we we love working with these applications. Thank you. This is great. So yeah, let's uh, discuss now. Uh, you know, a data lake and real time analytics approaches. So what is data lake analytics, right? Uh, so data lakes is nothing but your centralized uh, storage repository uh, that can store large amount of uh, structure, semi-structure and unstructured data at any scale. It is a place to store every type of your data in its native format with a no fixed limits of on a size or a files, right? So you can store data as is without having first structure, uh, first structure uh, the data, right? And, and then you can run on top of a different types of analytics ranging from dashboards, visualization, data science, in like, uh, like data science, machine learning, to uh, guide or made better decisions, right? So basically, data lakes allows you to centralize, consolidate, and um, catalog your data, right? It also allows you to query uh, quickly and seamlessly integrate diverse data sources, formats, right? And data lakes are another, ex they are extremely popular way for providing data to your entire organization. So that's basically, you know, the short overview of a data lake. Um, Let's now understand what real-time analytics is. Great, yeah, I'd be glad to do that. So real-time analytics are a new pattern in analytics that start with typically with some kind of source of data. We often call it a fire hose, which is generating records at 
uh, millions or tens of millions per second. Those records are then fed into tables, which contain what we call unaggregated source data. So if we can get a click here to, there we go. So, and the thing that real-time analytics does is it allows you just to feed these, these uh, populate these tables containing billions or trillions of records and simply, and then run queries directly off them. So what we call slicing and dicing queries, where you're basically looking at the data from different angles and then getting answers typically in uh, seconds or even less than a second. There's another use, uh, or another pattern that we build on. And if we can get one more click, which is that it's not just humans asking these questions, it's often services. For example, an e-commerce uh, application that is rendering a web page to show to a user. In that case, the data is fed out of APIs and we can pre-aggregate in materialized views, which then allow us to respond to these applications <clears throat> as they are actually uh, you know, rendering a page or doing some other operation. In this case, we're looking for response time on, in, in the millisecond range. Who has this problem? Well, it's actually a wide range of applications. I'm just giving five examples here, running from financial services to real-time uh, monitoring. But this pattern is now becoming pervasive in large and small digital businesses, which are just generating these clouds of data and then need to act on them quickly. Awesome. Thanks for explaining us what real-time analytics is. Um, so, so we understood what data lake is, uh, what real-time uh, analytics is, right? So now let's discuss how do you know which approach is best for you? Let's start off with, uh, you know, uh, Presto. How can you use a uh, Presto as a SQL query engine for your big data solutions? And uh, before we jump into the solution, let's quickly start off with uh, what are today's challenges for a data platform engineers, right? Since storage and compute gets bound, that always makes it difficult uh, to upscale or downscale further, right? Downscale, right? Further, uh, which uh, affects the cost. Uh, and as you as your data uh, and use cases grow, you add more diverse uh, data sources. So more engines, more uh, more more like you add a Spark, you add a real time engines, and so on, right? Which further becomes very difficult for your data analyst to know these different types of data sources. What are the best uh, practice to run SQL queries in a much for a performant way? For example, if you want to uh, if you want to run SQL on Spark, you need to run a Spark SQL, right? So you need to also take care of SQL dialects, right? And next is the onboarding time. This is not just how much amount you spend uh, to spin up a cluster or uh, that is the provisioning of those cluster or setting up the environment, but also the time taken to onboard some of these uh, tables, uh, for example, derived tables from the source tables that your data analyst can use uh, as quick as possible, right? And, and at the last uh, is the cost, right? As you may already know, the, while the cloud data warehouses are the inexpensive for the small scale, but the many uh, enterprises find that the cost grows much faster than expected as this data and the usage scales, right? Particularly, particularly with the uh, exploding volume, variety and velocity of the, the data that we have today. So these are some of the challenges, right? So, so if you want to break down uh, the solution, let's start off with what do we need, right? So, um, so what do we have? So we have these users, right? They are probably pretty demanding, uh, and you have a data, right? So you need some some way uh, for these users to, to talk to that data. Right, and for most of us, that's going to be called SQL. Right, again, SQL is great; it's industry standard. Right, users like to query their data using SQL. So, um, right. And then, but for the SQL to work, you need some uh, type of abstraction layer that, that will translate well to the data that your users want to access. It, it needs to have a defined mechanism to catalog uh, and secure the data. Without these elements, data cannot be found or trusted, and that can result into data swamps, right? So again, traditionally, that has been done in a meta store tables. Uh, Right, and uh, some type of catalogs or some way that translates SQL queries to how your data is actually structured on the disk. Right. Um, and then last but not the least, that you need some type of a system that authenticate. Uh, 
yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, at the least, you need uh, some uh, sort of a system that authenticates and authorizes these users to do, to do the stuff, right? So great. So what do we call this thing? So this is this. If we will put all this together, this is nothing but your you know a data warehouse or a cloud data warehouse. And uh, this is if you want to break down, this is your rate shift or snowflake or uh, you know vertica or even Terra data, right? That's what they are this data on a disk uh, with some type of a metadata and a type of query layer then users uh, that access that data right but as we know these cloud data warehouses are not always most least uh, least expensive uh, answers right especially as the amount of data that you uh, that you have gets bigger and bigger and some of that data may be maybe super useful, valuable. Some of the some of maybe less valuable. But no more, matter what the value of your data is, you want to be able to provide it to your users in a most most cost effective way, right? So again, cloud data warehouse is a great answer to this question. But that's usually pretty expensive, and they lock you in uh, so that no longer have a choices about where you store your data, what format you use, who can access it, and you know what language you use. So, so if we where we can save money, right? So, so we, where we can break this down and uh, save more money, but still provide the same level of uh, analytics to our user. So again, let's start from the bottom, right? Let's look at the data which is stored at the disk. How do you make that cheaper, right? Well, uh, so we can store that data uh, in more uh, analytical friendly format like Parquet or ORC, and we can store that uh, in places like S3, right? Which are relatively expensive, inexpensive. You have heard about this structure before. So this is nothing but your data lake. Right, and what's great about the data lake is that it un unlocks your data to all different types of users, right? Not just you, not just your users, but that might be asking you know right questions. But those users might be using uh, machine learning and AI, right? See, these data lakes are a pretty popular way of providing uh, data to entire organization. Moving to the next slide, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so all right, so next what we have is the metadata tables. I mean, this is pretty much infrastructure, but luckily there are ways to replace that as well. So what do we have? So we have a uh, high meta store, or if you are on Amazon, you can use AWS Glue, again, fairly inexpensive, but it allows the translation of the data that's in your data lake into some type of a structure. And then you need some type of a system, some type of a system to authenticate. So here you you can use auth or you can use um, any any one of your favorite um, um, authentication mechanism. And at the at, at the end you have this. Uh, you can use uh, Apache Ranger for authorizing these users, which is another open source project. Or you can use a Lake Formation if you are like a AWS shop, right? Uh, this way you can uh, provide authorization and uh, provide access for your users. Okay, but last but not the least, we have the SQL portion, right? So how can you replace the SQL portion for the data that's in your data lake? And for that, we have a Presto, right? Presto is open source project that came out of a Facebook as a successor of a Hive. So Presto is massively scalable, distributed in memory system that allows you to write queries, uh, not just against uh, the data link files, but also the various data sources as well. So, so Presto is an uh, excellent option for uh, reducing a cost of your analytics, right? So all together, what we have is, uh, is nothing but the I call data lake house, like open SQL data lake house. So we are replacing each portion um, of this data warehouse with an very open and less expensive standards, but we still get the same functionality in a, and in the same way, you are going to be able to get, even, even you are going to get more actually. Because not only you have equal access to the data files, but like I mentioned earlier, you can allow all other users that might be doing data mining, AI, uh, to, to access that data on the data lake. So this is a quick overview of uh, Presto architecture. Right. It's a typical distributed system of a coordinators and num uh, workers. Coordinators are responsible to query, uh, do a query planning, administrative tasks, scheduling, checking workers' health, and etc. Right. And then workers are responsible to responsible to do actual leg work, responsible to perform actual work on across these different data sets, different partitions, splits, all in memory. 
So, and you have you and you can connect uh, Presto with any reporting tools as shown above, right? Uh, using standard JDBC, ODBC protocols, you can use notebooks like Jupyter, Apache Zeppelin, etc., to access and analyze data. And on the bottom, uh, you you have your data lake like S3, as well as a range of these data sources like NoSQL databases, re relational databases, streaming data sources like Kafka, caching, and other real-time data sources like Pinot or Druid and ClickHouse as well, right? So you have the ability to do the federation, a federated query, which means that, hey, I can join the data between MySQL, Redshift, I can join data between MySQL and S3. Also, you can join data between S3 and Elasticsearch. This is something that doesn't exist in most of the technologies today. So you, essentially, you can query these data sources underneath, right? Presto will abstract the query for you. For example, it will abstract your MySQL query, make it more uh, MySQL uh, query calls and if you are using Hadoop it can, it can abstract that and make the appropriate API calls and so on right so definitely this way you can achieve a federation any questions on on that uh, any questions so far nope we can keep going Rohan awesome all right so yeah so and what do you get as an outcome right when you use a presto for your data analytics right so a presto allows you to disaggregate your storage and compute so you can scale up and down independent of a storage is easily presto allows you for a query federation without moving your data so which further gives you an ability to unify the sql access and faster onboarding right and last but not least is the price performance i like uh, i like to call it as a like performance as a price performance yes presto is a sparks it's linearly uh, scalable but what's true value of presto is essentially um, price performance for a customer right so for a fraction of the price that you pay for the services like redshift snowflake you have an ability to uh, get the real business value real time at uh, time to value as far as your you know analytics are concerned now let's look at the e-commerce app which is powered by presto so here is uh, how one of our customer has built their data lake house with presto and data lakes for their e-commerce use case so they got the transaction data, they got point of sale data, click streams, event streams, right? And then they are using Apache uh, Spark for batch processing, uh, Flink for streaming, uh, and this data is getting ingested into data lakes. Um, they are using Hoodie as their uh, data lake table format, which, which gives them further ability to uh, achieve that onboarding time, like creating derived tables off of their source table. And further, you have uh, Hive as a catalog uh, that translates this uh, data which is sitting in S3. And Presto acts as a heart of uh, this architecture, providing unified SQL engine uh, that you can use to access not just the data sitting in S3, but if you have any real-time analytics going on, you can also use it uh, with other data sources and achieve a query for federation without moving your data around, right? And then you have at the end, the data analyst using their favorite BI tool to access this data. With that, I would like to give you guys a quick demo of how you can query S3 data using Presto and also do some sort of a federation. So let's jump to my, my, my Presto shell. So here I'm using, can you guys see my uh, shell here, by the way? And then is it readable? Okay. So here uh, I'm using one of a uh, Presto cluster that is a uh, provided by Ahana. And let's quickly see what catalogs I have here. So if I do show catalogs, right, so if I do show catalogs, okay, okay there's a typo. Right, so I have a glue catalog set up, I have a hoodie catalog set up, and I have a bunch of other catalogs also. So today I'm going to show you guys uh, the S3 data, which is uh, uh, sitting in form of glue tables. So if we do, let's see what all tables I have uh, created in a glue. So if I do show schemas from a glue, I can see all these uh, schemas, all these databases. Basically, when you connect, when you configure a connector, it instantiates a catalog within a Presto, and each catalog ha uh, has its own schemas, and further schemas got their own tables. So let's see what tables we got in a, in a glue, PQ, 
and yeah, there is uh, this rich line transactions. I'm going to use this transaction table. So if we do a quick aggregation query on our transaction tables based off of uh, total of, you know, uh, the of that transaction amount, and we can see the the to total based on the total uh, based on categories, we can see their total amount for the each uh, category. And this is trying to, I'm trying to access the data which is sitting in a glue. Basically, if I can show you my AWS console. So this is my AWS glue service. And if I go to databases, these are all my schemas that we saw. And PQ is the, the schema that I'm accessing within there. I have this table, This is these tables, and you can see that this data uh, sits in S3 buckets. So this is good that we able to access the data which is sitting in S3. Now let's do a quick uh, query federation, right? So let's try to see what's sitting in my MySQL uh, table, in, right? So let's run a quick select query to understand my customer's data which is sitting in my MySQL table. And, and let me join these two, two tables to get some insights and understand Hey, what's what is the city or what is the state which is more expensive in terms of when we uh, combine the transaction table which is sitting in a glue in S3 and then the customer data which is sitting in a hoodie, which is MySQL actually. You can see California is most expensive. So yeah, this way you guys can do the query federation with a Presto. Any questions uh, so far, folks, um, before we move to the next slide? It does look like we have a question here. Um, how do we load and maintain data in Presto? So again, yeah, so Presto is just a SQL engine. You can, there is a no data, it's not a database really, it's just a query engine. So you can have data sitting in anywhere, like any, we have almost 30 connectors or that you can connect to, or you can have a data store in S3 that you can connect uh, the with, uh, with uh, some sort of a metadata because you need some kind of a translation as I explained. Yeah, um, I hope that answers your question, right? So. You don't have to worry about where you store the data when you use uh, Presto. You, it, it is that's that's one of the value proposition of Presto that you can run queries data in place without moving your data. Great, uh, Just another data one. Data store. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Rohan. Uh, where do you where do you define DDL? So um, good question. So if you are creating a tables if you are creating existing tables so you don't have to do ddl you just you just need to configure the catalog the way i configured here right so these all tables are where i already existing in my uh glue so you don't have to do that but there is a, there are also ddl statements you can definitely do a create a table as and uh, provide the provide the provide the file or the location external location where you want to st store so basically so in short form if you have existing data sitting in a um, glue or anywhere you just need to connect with a catalog you don't have to do ddl stuff or any type of mapping but if you want to create with a presto presto allows you to uh, create tables you just need to provide the external location Okay, hey, another one. Uh, is there any UI to configure the catalog? Unfortunately, no. You need to, um, this is, you need to, you know, um, there is a no UI. You have to do through uh, the typical uh, file format. There is a catalog.properties that you need to maintain with all the configurations. So I can show you guys actually. Um, so. I can quickly show you my can uh, catalog property here up here. Give me a minute. Put a bunch of windows open. Just one more minute. I will show you guys how you configure those these connectors. Okay. 
yeah so basically you need to set up this config file on um all your nodes all presto nodes basically this is my uh property catalog properties file for my group glue connector right so if i do vi this is nothing but the connector name high meta store uh, and some of the properties and aws access key and secret key to access that glue but there is a no ui yes any hey. more questions folks i think we're good let's uh keep moving awesome so with Thanks. that let's understand how real-time analytics um, uh, works and what approaches we have. And Robert, take it away. Great. I'm going to start my share. Let's sure. uh, go push up the... Let me know when you can see my screen. We can see your screen. OK, awesome. <clears throat> Let's dive in. OK, so uh, similar to what Rohan just showed you, I'd like to talk about a few of the challenges for real-time analytics. And they include loading from fire hoses, uh, literally tens of millions of rows uh, per second, even in applications that are run by relatively small companies. Another thing is that if you've got users uh, running dashboards, doing slicing and dicing queries, you want the low latency to be small and to be constant. So no matter how much data they have, no matter how many tenants you have, it's the same. You want very fast response to software that's asking questions in the midst of real-time operations, you know, like loading web pages, um, uh, doing bids, uh, making recommendations. And then of course you wanna be able to scale and do that cheaply. So these are all things that come up in real-time analytics and uh, up till a few years ago, made this a very difficult space where there weren't good solutions. That has changed over the last, I would say, six to seven years. And one of the big reasons it's changed is because of ClickHouse. So ClickHouse is a SQL data warehouse, and uh, it does the queries that we just saw Rohan doing. You can do the same queries in ClickHouse. Uh, so it supports SQL. It can do joins. It does group by, does sort, you know, standard stuff. You'll find it all there. Um, it also is open source, similar to Presto. It's when we get into the middle where it starts to look really different. So it runs practically anywhere. You can literally run it on an Android phone. We have actually a demo, which is going on tomorrow, which is going to be run on uh, uh, Raspberry Pis uh, and all the way up to clusters running in the cloud containing hundreds of nodes. The largest clusters we know about contain well over a thousand servers. Uh, it uses a shared nothing architecture. This is traditional data warehouse uh, design where you have a bunch of nodes that have patches of storage that they own and they communicate over a network. It stores the data in columns. So unlike uh, Presto, which is reading off existing data without moving it, we actually have a specialized file format that we depend on that is optimized for uh, analytic queries. And that includes uh, columnar storage with very high compression and a number of other interesting features. Uh, parallel and vectorized execution, and then scaling to tens of petabytes without a problem. And as a result of these features, being an open source, being super cost efficient, it's become very popular for real-time analytics. A typical application will be like this little picture where you have various types of data sources, event streams, ELT, you know, data pipelines, if you will, object storage, and then emitting data out through uh, operational dashboards, interactive graphic displays, often custom developed, and then APIs. So that's ClickHouse, but rather than go into too many more details, I'm going to just show you how it works and just give you some quick examples. So let me grab my uh, UI here and I'm going to pull it in and I'm talking to a ClickHouse server that's running in alternative.cloud. Let's just see what it's running. So this is ClickHouse version 22.8. That is a version that came out in August. It's a long-term support version. And Altenity stable means it's uh, Altenity has ClickHouse builds that we provide. They have three years of support. So that's what we're running. There's also uh, community builds from, uh, from the main ClickHouse project. So let's uh, pick a table and see how big it is. So here's our table, our test table that we'll be using. We're just gonna count the rows. There we go, oh, that's gonna slope. 
a little bit of late to see we're going to uh, uh, data center some distance away. But what we can see here is we actually have over, slightly over a uh, hair over a trillion rows here. And this is a, uh, a pretty large data set. It's running on a single VM with 36 vCPUs and uh, a, a bunch of memory. There's no glory in counting things quickly. Uh, we use metadata hacks that mean that that answer is almost instant. What is interesting is start to look at some, try and fetch some data out of this database and see how fast that is. So these are temperature readings in this database. Uh, a million sensors, each providing uh, a million readings. Let's go find the maximum temperature for a particular uh, sensor. And uh, we'll go ahead and run this. And we get that answer back out of the, fetched out of that trillion row data set in 4.81 seconds. So that's great. We know what the maximum temperature was that, that we reached on this, and we got it in less than half a second. So if we're some analyst trying to figure out why this thing is goofing up, we can pretty quickly see what it's doing. Let's go see which day that happened, because maybe we're interested in you know, something related to the date. We can extend this to uh, go find the maximum temperature. And we're starting to see a little bit of specialized syntax here to find the date when that maximum temperature was released. Let's run that. And that takes 800 milliseconds. But we got the date. So still under a, uh, under a second. This for us, if, if uh, it's great for a human, that's, that's really not a big deal. But if this were software ads asking this question, to find out what day that happened, that would be highly unsatisfactory. We can fix that. Uh, what we can use is these materialized views, which I mentioned just a little while ago. Let's go ahead and show an example of asking exact, exactly the same question, except that instead of using the source table, we're gonna use a materialized view, which has pre-computed some of the aggregation, basically uh, aggregated by day, as it turns out. And uh, we run that, and boom, we get the answer back in 19 seconds. And because there's a little bit of cache heating effect here, if we play around with this, we get five milliseconds. If you ask this question regularly, you have a very, very quick response. If you're doing something that requires you to, you know, like you're loading a, generating a web page for somebody, let's say that this is not 10, uh, uh, you know, uh, a sensor information, but instead a recommendation of something like an offer to make somebody, you got the answer in five milliseconds. So these are all examples of how ClickHouse can answer these basic questions on data very, very quickly. So this is, again, as I say, a trillion rows of data, we can get answers out of it very, very quickly. Let's go back and then talk about, what I'd really like to do is talk about how does ClickHouse do this so quickly? So, um, well, if there's a way to make a database quick, particularly an analytic database, there's a pretty good chance that ClickHouse does it. So everything from compression to tiered storage to skip indexes, which are ways of uh, avoiding things to read and reducing I.O., vectorized query, that basically means we read columns, we kind of treat them as arrays, we push them onto the CPU in a way that uh, that both matches well against the cache structure. For example, in Intel architectures, it also uses uh, what are called SIMD instructions, single instruction multi-data. The list goes on and on of all the ways that ClickHouse is optimized to make those queries that I just show you, showed you run extremely quickly. What I'd like to do is, I mentioned that we can do the queries that you saw from, from Rohan, and you just saw some simple examples. Instead of going into more simple queries, what I'm going to do is dig into some different ways that ClickHouse is specialized and allows people to build extremely fast applications. So let's look at some examples of these. First of all, when you're building these real-time applications and you want to have very fast response that doesn't vary very much. One of the best ways you can do that is put all your data on one table. This is not because we can't do joins. I want to be clear about that. ClickHouse can do joins, although it used to be it wasn't very good at them. But if you if you start to join very large tables, particularly if the data is split across uh, many hosts, it becomes very slow because you end up having to move data. This, if, if you're familiar with query optimization, this is slow, it's also unpredictable. 
So what we actually do is in these applications is we'll often choose what's called the one big table design, where we'll put all of our entities into a single table. And what that means is that table will have extra columns because some entities need some columns, other entities need, need others. I'll show you the example of that. And then we have what's called a discriminator, which is this message type that you can see in this picture. So we have three entities. Let me show you what the table looks like to do this. So this is it. It's SQL, but it has slightly different since we use, traditionally use different data type names, although you can now use the ANSI types. But what's really interesting is these extra features. So for example, the sensor ID uses what's called a codec. Codec is a, is a function that can make data smaller before it's handed over to compression, in this case, ZSDD. ClickHouse can do uh, a couple of different types of uh, compression, but in this case, what gets stored is using this double delta codec. We don't store, the, the data are, are stored in the column, and what we, we don't store the values, we don't store the differences between the values, that's called a delta codec. We store the differences between the differences in the values, the slope of the slope. If you think about it a little bit, anything that is monotonically increasing, this will reduce, this will result in bits literally being stored per row. And you can see a number of other ways that we use this. Uh, you know, different kinds of codecs. We have dictionary encoding for strings, more double delta, T64, which is a good one for uh, for floats. Uh, all of these are available to you. It's very easy to tweak the, the table schema, change these on the fly, so on and so forth. Another thing I want to point out is we use what are called engines. So MySQL had these, if you're familiar with InnoDB, but ClickHouse has them in spades. There's dozens of them. But the workhorse is called Merge Tree, and that's designed for big data. It is uh, uses what's called partitioning, a partition key, so a way of breaking up the data into pieces so that we have chunks typically of time-ordered data. And then we have an order by which sorts the columns and allows us to scan very quickly, have contiguous sections of data that interest us, and also order it in a way that will make compression work better. So these are this right here is a way this this structure is a way that we have available to make things very fast. Um, once you do this with this big table model, there's another interesting feature that you can use with ClickHouse. You can actually scan and do aggregates. Here I'm doing simple ones like counts. Um, I can scan them and I can do different counts based on the entity type with the table. And this is a really wonderful ClickHouse feature called an if combinator. It's an aggregate that's count, which everybody's familiar with. That's that's uh, you know comes out of ANSI SQL. Uh, but this count if says, hey, I'm only going to do the count if the message type is reading, and I'm only going to do the second count if the message type is restart. And what this does is, in a, in most databases, you would actually have to do two passes through the data and then join the results, to uh, or or do a union or some some trick like that. In this particular case, we're able to scan. We we just do a single scan down the data, and as a result, it's extremely fast. And in fact, it's not only fast, but as we can control the number of threads in this, this max thread says how many vCPUs. ClickHouse will make up its mind if you don't tell it, but here we're saying, hey, use 16, and we can play around with this. And this graph on the right shows how the performance of this query scales linearly as we add more hardware threads or vCPUs to it. And you can see that it scales linearly from one to 16 threads, and then it tails off a little bit at 32, probably because we're saturating the IO bandwidth. So this is another example of how ClickHouse has specialized features, extensions of SQL, different ways of thinking about the problem that result in extremely high query performance. Um, here's another cool trick, the uh, joins. So everybody, you need to do joins to, uh, you know, for a wide number of, of reasons. But one really interesting thing that ClickHouse can do is that we can use different ways to do joins that don't require us to move data. So for example, let's say that we want to join the restart. We, these are temperature sensors, they need to restart. We'd like to join the, the restart uh, time of the sensor with the succeeding readings that, uh, you know, say maybe the 10 readings that come after the restart time. So uh, normally you would do a join, which would require two scans of the data. 
if the data is in different locations, that could be problematic. You might have to move things around to make the data match up so that you could actually join it. In ClickHouse, we can use a different technique. And that is we make it an aggregation problem. So one of the things that ClickHouse can do is it has some very powerful aggregation functions that actually treat data as arrays. So when we, instead of having a join key, we aggregate by the, uh, we group by the key that we would normally join on, which in this case is the sensor ID. And then we we pick up the restart time and then we have, you know, based on, you know, whatever query filters we're using or other conditions, we can then pull in things like the time we took readings and the temperatures that were associated with them. These are aggregate functions that allow us to collect this information. We then have another feature in ClickHouse fee, uh, SQL called an array join. And that allows us to, these arrays get collected. And when the joins are, you know, when the data is finally merged together across all the nodes that it's collected from, we can then use this array join command, another extension of SQL, which will pivot it back out to look as if it had just been joined. So the effect is that you can see the sensor ID and then you can actually, in this case, I was computing the uptime uh, following, the, following the restart and then I could see the temperature. This is something that you would normally do a, a join or a self join in if you were doing this in a in a conventional table. ClickHouse does it through aggregation. It does it in a single scan. I'm not going to show you the code for this uh, query in the interest of time, but when I run it, it completes in milliseconds. It's extremely fast. Moreover, it would it would get roughly the same performance regardless of how big the table is. So that's another really kind of interesting way that that real-time databases allow you to, uh, real-time analytic databases allow you to rethink these problems. And then a final thing is what about cases where we need to index data or find out particular, uh, find the answers to particular questions uh, and uh, so that we can answer them very quickly. In other words, pre-aggregate the data, compute it in advance. A typical question that we might ask on, on sensors is, hey, when's the last time this sensor restarted? Can we find that out quickly? Because you know, if I'm going to see, uh, you know, if, if I want to see that that previous query, uh, you know, I'd want to start off by knowing when the restart time was. Well, we can make the answer to that also be an aggregation task. And the basic idea is that we will scan the data and we're going to group by the key and find the maximum value that uh, is associated with the, uh, you know, the maximum time value, and then we'll also be able to, you know, to see the matching row value. This is uh, a very simple operation to do inside uh, ClickHouse. It's you can have this as a query, and you can just run it on the fly to answer this question without doing, you know, just by doing a single scan. But what's really interesting in ClickHouse is we can take this this uh, scan and we can basically turn it into uh, uh, this question, we can turn it into a query that is used to feed a materialized view. So every time something is loaded into ClickHouse, so as I mentioned, these blocks of data can be read in, we can process millions or tens of billions of rows per second. This query will be run on it, which is looking for the maximum time. And it's going to go ahead and feed that into what's called an aggregated merge tree table. This is a specialized table engine that's designed to store aggregated data extremely efficiently. And it will automatically, it'll allow us to automatically drop the older restart times as newer ones arrive. So this is an example again of a question that might be you know, answered by joins, might be uh, uh, require complex queries. It can be turned into an aggregation problem and allows us to deliver extremely fast results to our applications. So with this, you can see that the, you know, I've just given you a, a flavor of the things that ClickHouse can do. They are unique, they're creative, but the result is that for thousands of applications worldwide, people are getting benefits like the following. Uh, first of all, they get very convenient aggregate, uh, uh, in integration to ingest. I haven't showed you that, but we can read, for example, data from Kafka. We can read from S3. We'll, sh we'll show an example of that shortly. You can get very fast response on, on the unaggregated source data. 
just put the rows in as they arrived. We'll get the data out in a hurry. Um, we can pre-aggregate to get very quick examples. That five millisecond response on the you know to to compute when the when a particular sensor hit the highest temperature. Uh, that's a very simple um, uh, thing to set up in a materialized view. We can scale the resources to keep the re uh, response constant. If the data set becomes too large to fit in a single machine, we can go ahead and shard it out across machines, have multiple replicas, get more compute, get more um, storage bandwidth applied to it. And then finally, it's super cost efficient. And just to give you an example, there was one pretty well-known migration that uh, Content Square did a few years back where they came off uh, uh, Elasticsearch and went to ClickHouse. The resulting system was 10 times faster, but also at the same time, 10 times less costly than running it on Elasticsearch. And that was because they were using ClickHouse with these formidable performance enhancements. Oops, we just lost you, I think, Robert. Oh, lost audio there for a second. There we go. Uh, okay. All okay, right, great, great. So uh, yeah, so I was saying Content Square had done this this amazing example of an integration where they basically got ten times faster, ten times cheaper versus Elasticsearch, and that's just because of the performance features of ClickHouse. Uh, with that, that's I'm done boasting about ClickHouse. I like it a lot, so I have to confess. But let's talk a little bit about mixing and matching, so the data lake and the real-time models. And uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Rohan again for a couple slides to talk about how you can pull the real-time data into, into Presto. Yeah, sure. So as I said before, right, around 30 different connectors are already supported with Presto, and then one of them is ClickHouse connector, which means that you can use this connector to query ClickHouse tables from a Presto. And uh, not just you have the ability to do query in place without having to move this data around different data sources or maybe a decentralized data source. You have the ability to do a federated query, which means that you can run a query to join these ClickHouse tables uh, with the tables that might be sitting in MySQL, maybe AWS Glue, maybe you can join these tables with uh, elastic search tables right or any other data source which is connected to presto can you please move to the next slide where i have kind of a demo example where we are where i'm trying to connect clickhouse uh, customer table to uh, orders table which is sitting in my e glue right and trying to get some insight out of it so yeah so it's basically that easy yeah, it's super easy. Just configure a connector yeah. and you have access. You don't have to do um, DDLs once again mapping. Only just you need to make sure that the data types that there, which exist in ClickHouse, are supported in Presto. And if they are not supported, there are some kind of a configuration that you need to do. But that's it's uh, it's not a lot of uh, task. It's cool. just part of connector configuration. Yeah. Cool. Let's turn that around. Let's say ClickHouse wants to go see what's going out in the data going on out in the data lake world. So it turns out ClickHouse is getting pretty decent at uh, reading uh, things from ob object storage. I'll just give a simple example. Um, there's something called the S3 table function, which is a table function in ClickHouse is a function that you can call in a query, and it allows you it returns uh, result a result set. So uh, in other words, a table. Uh, you can use that to select values directly out of files that are in S3. And uh, so for example, you could have a bunch of Parquet files out there. They're uh, served up by Amazon S3 or anything that has comparable uh, API or sort of equivalent APIs. The S3 table function gets them and you can basically do then this very simple select. Much as Rohan says, the data types have to be, you know, have to match. But as long as they do, you can read CSV, you can read Parquet, you can read uh, ORC, uh, you know, anything you want. Here's an example of a query kind of similar to the ones we were looking at before, where I've got a sensor type or a sensor type one, uh, you know, sort of there were different sensor types in this data set. And I wanted to know the max temperature and the min temperature that they recorded. I just go ahead and select it from S3. Um, I give the the bucket and I give the path. You can see I can use wildcards and I just tell ClickHouse, give it a hint, hey, this is Parquet, so that it doesn't have to think about it. It just sucks the data in and reads it. 
and 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 burps out the results. It's not as fast as using uh, as as reading from the merge tree tables, which are the demos I showed you, but it is pretty fast. And in fact, one of the things I didn't cover ingest, but just to give you a hint, if I put an insert in front of this, I can this select that I'm showing you. I can use that select to pull data into ClickHouse merge tree tables. This is, in fact, how we normally ingest from S3. So awesome. with that, we're, uh, we're to the conclusion. Were there any, Ali, I, did we get any questions on uh, ClickHouse? We got a bunch. So why don't oh, we man. through those quickly? Uh, <laughs> yeah. We can wrap up. So first is, how does ClickHouse do compute? Uh, it is a honed C++ executable, unbelievably optimized. So uh, what's what you're looking at there in the end, if you're if you're uh, doing a query, you're talking to a single C++ process, which is uh, highly optimized for uh, for scanning data very quickly and aggregating it very quickly using parallel query. Uh, but it, it kind of you can think of it as being more or less like MySQL. Just imagine it can run with sharding and replication. Perfect. OK. Uh, yes, Sorry. we need. We need to dump data uh, to ClickHouse, or can they read from S3? Um, absolutely. In fact, I just showed you this example. Uh, the fastest way to get, there's a bunch of ways to get uh, data into, into ClickHouse. You can do inserts. Uh, for example, you know, if you have CSV files, you can just read them straight off your client. Uh, ClickHouse is a very simple way of attaching them to inserts. It reads a bunch of different file formats. There's 50 or 60 of them. And I, uh, you know, so and you can just insert directly from CSV. You don't have to turn them into SQL. Um, can it connect with Mode BI tool? I actually don't know what that is. Uh, it connects with pretty much everything I've ever used. Uh, uh, so Grafana is one of the most popular ones. Uh, 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 it works with Looker. Uh, uh, we we built a Tableau. Uh, 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 connector for it. It also works with superset. You name it, it probably works. So if you have a specific question, if you can ping me later on, uh, I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, count if can be done with, uh, yeah, so actually uh, th there's a point here. Count if can be done with uh, with CSA expression and one pass in SQL. Um, actually, that's not entirely true. And uh, most databases end up having to do multiple passes with this, but not all of them. It really depends on the on the database. Uh, the, the behavior with that ClickHouse shows, the thing is that when I code this, I know it's doing it in one single pass. I know it's, and that it's not, in fact, going out and pre-querying things for me. So you would actually have to look at the query plan to ensure that it's, to ensure how it's accessing the data. In ClickHouse, there's no question. It's doing it in a single pass. So, but if you have counterexamples, I'd love to hear about them. Uh, the uh, it's a uh, it's an interesting area. Uh, another one: Does ClickHouse support time series database? Yes, uh, extremely well. So ClickHouse is not a time series database per se, but it is very good at handling time order data. It has multiple data types for it. And it has a host of functions, dozens of them, that allow you to manipulate time and do things like, hey, group things by hour, group things by minute, group things by week, so on and so forth, as well as handle time intervals. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, compare real-time speed of ClickHouse with the speed of Uber streaming using Hoodie. I I don't have, I don't know enough about that, about what you're describing there, to comment on it. Um, it, so that one, if you provide more information, I, I mean, I can show you. I've showed you how fast it is on our side. I'd have to know more, uh, more about that to be able to answer that intelligently. Ah, can ClickHouse replace Elasticsearch? Um, a lot of people use it for this purpose, not for every uh, Elasticsearch application, but for things. A very common one that it's used for is log management, um, as well as observability cases. ClickHouse is very good for that. Uh, but there are many, many other ways that people use Elasticsearch. Uh, so, but if you have those particular use cases, then you should definitely look at ClickHouse. Um, can we scale uh, up and down ClickHouse dynamically or automatically? ClickHouse itself does not do this without help. So, um, but 
all the cloud operations, uh, all the clouds that ClickHouse offer uh, give you quick ways to scale things up and down. We, in fact, also uh, wrote the ClickHouse operator, uh, uh, which that was written by Altinity, and that has really great vertical scaling. And it also has very good uh, support for <laughs> horizontal scaling, uh, adding shards, adding replicas, so on and so forth. So um, uh, yeah, can the table function return results in parallel for high volume ingestion into ClickHouse? Yes, that is a really great question. Uh, there's a uh, set max in th insert threads is your friend. That's the property you want to set. If you do not see, if you're not able to load data in at millions, if you have, you know, like a capable uh, VM, for example, you're loading into S3. If you're not able to get millions of inserts per second, you want to give us a call because you're doing something wrong. Uh, this test data set, when I was loading it, it wasn't actually come, I was generating the data on the fly, but I was loading that test data set at 80 million rows per second. So it's it's very, very fast on ingest. And you just need to, sometimes you'll need to play around to make sure you've got a, a sufficient storage bandwidth to hit those numbers, but uh, we can definitely, definitely help you and ClickHouse can do it. So, um, hey, these are great questions. Thank you so much, everybody. I, Ali, shall we go ahead and turn to the wrap up? Because I think we're getting close to the top of the hour here. Yeah, so, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, go yeah. for it. So, so do your best. What is it you get out of Presto, uh, Rohan? Yeah. So, as I already mentioned here, like data lakes with Presto gives um, data engineers, data architects more flexibility, best price performance, and one unified uh, SQL interface for their data. Great, real-time analytics, as you saw, fast reaction, constant query response on very rapidly arriving data. You can yeah. use it for other things. We use it for our billing. It doesn't really arrive that rapidly, but but that's the that's the sweet spot and where you get these, can create these uniquely powerful applications. Uh, and I will say on the flip side, if you have you know a thousand data sources, that's probably not the database you wanna use. I'd say, talk to Rohan and Ali about that. <laughs> There you and go. then, and yeah. then you can mix the approaches. So uh... we see that all the time that people have a batch processing going with Spark. They are using Flink for uh, streaming, and then you can use Clickstream for real-time analytics. And you have a Presto to do achieve a federation off of it. Yep. <clears throat> and then with ClickHouse, if you know if you got the data lake out there, you can then turn around and and actually use these capabilities to read the data lake data directly. We do not have the same capabilities, so that the same breadth of of, of file support that Presto does, but that's actually an active area of innovation on ClickHouse. So we're going to see that improving rapidly over the next year or two. And I think that's it. Yep. So wow. uh, yeah, this has been really fun. Thank you, Ali, for setting this up. Yeah, thank you. thank you both. What a fantastic um, session. I learned a lot. I hope everybody that that's here also got a lot out of it. Thank you for sticking with us. I know it was a it was a lot of content jammed into 60 minutes, but great stuff. I think there is one more question for you, Robert, if you want to just answer it. Um, yes. Uh, what's the best processor or Amazon instance to run ClickHouse on? Uh, I, that's a great question. It's Generally speaking, we're using uh, M5s and M6s, and we're using Graviton. Uh, there's, I think it's M7i and M6, uh, or M6g, uh, M7g. We like Graviton, uh, but in general, it's it's and it's it's it tends to be more than just the instances. Uh, there's other things you need to think about on on uh, Amazon. Good example, uh, if you're using EBS storage, a pro trick is to use stacked volumes. Don't just have a single EBS. Uh, uh, file system mounted, have multiple file systems, it will double or triple your storage bandwidth without paying any extra to Amazon. We have a bunch of tricks like that we've learned through running uh, running ClickHouse in the cloud. No, that's it's, a great trick. We use that as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to do it on GCP, but because yes. uh, it the bandwidth scales automatically. So. Great. Okay, so we are two awesome. minutes past the hour. Uh, again, thank you to everybody who joined us today. You will get a link to this recording as well as the slides. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Rohan. Awesome presentation. I think we're planning on maybe doing a meetup uh, yes. at some point to go more into showing like how uh, Presto and ClickHouse work together in a demo sort of format. So more to come on that.
April seventeenth. Oh. Stay tuned. Oh, it's the, okay. the SF Bay go. Area Clickhouse Meetup. <laughs> Rohan, if you're available, uh, yeah, we'd love to. It. We'd love to have you and dive into yeah. how that connection yeah. works. Let's do awesome. it. All right. All right. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye everybody. Thank you.